Several verses. You can do. We finished on number forty yesterday. Yeah, I'm, I, I wonder why this is uh, given three verses when they all have purpose. I know. Well, forty. I haven't even done forty-one. I did forty yesterday. So should I do forty-one? Well, forty-four. I don't, I don't know which one. Forty-four is written on the verse. But forty-one. Yeah, yeah I told him. I told him to leave forty-one on. The, I told him to leave forty-one on the board, but he didn't do it. One has a purple, 42 has a purple, 43 has a purple, and 44 has a purple. Yeah, no, wait a minute, I think 44 doesn't. Yes, it does, so I... I yeah, what's going on? You only need a couple of lines of purple, and away you go. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's just, it says outside 42 to 44 on the, on the schedule. That's what it's written on the board, but yesterday we only did up to 40. The idea is to go speed through it or something. You know, we're not advanced enough for the tenth canto. We don't like yeah. you don't like the past times outside Vrindavan. Yeah. I think, the, <laughs> I think the, the idea was the idea was that because it's not well, as purpose, that was the idea. I it's see, it's not go purpose, through the events. It's all completely focused, but we have to uh, <laughs> get to go through the ritual. The uh, sun that used to be there, finish by 8.30 or you'll get shot. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's not there anymore. Change of management. It's been quite a few years now. <laughs> so, what am I doing? We could spend a whole class discussing. <laughs> should I just... I, I should read through them all. That would take up half the class. So. All right, here we go. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. 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 Srimad Bhagavatam Kanto 10. Chapter 52, text 41 was written on the board when I came in in the morning. Uh -huh. Let it have just been left there. Mm -hmm. So text 41 to 44. I'll just read text 41 to 43, and then we can uh, go through 44 together. Try Surround yourself with the leaders of your army. Then crush the forces of Chaija and Nagadindra, which means uh, Shishupal and Jarasandha, and marry me in the Rakshasa style, winning me with your bala. See, before she's married, she's giving orders to her. <laughs> 
As Srila Prabhupada points out in Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Rukmini, being born of royal blood, certainly had a brilliant grasp of political affairs. She advised Sri Krishna. That's only advice. It's not an honor. <laughs> to enter the city alone and unnoticed and then surround himself with his military commanders so he could do what was needed. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti compares the coming fight to the Lord's churning of the ocean to extract the goddess Lakshmi. Gorgeous, gorgeous Rukmini, the goddess of fortune, would be gained in the coming turbulence. Text 42. Antapuranta charim anihatya bandhu tramputvahe katamiti prabhadam yupayam purve diorasti mahati kulaje vayatra Yes, young Bahyanavadhur Girijam Upeyat. Since I will be staying within the inner chambers of the palace, you may wonder how can I carry you away without killing some of your relatives? But I shall tell you a way. On the day before the marriage there is a grand procession to honor the royal family's deity, and in this procession the new bride goes outside the city to visit Goddess Goddess Girija Apart. Clever, Rukmini anticipated a possible objection on the part of Sri Krishna. He certainly would not object to subduing rascals like Shishupal and Jarasandha, but he might be reluctant to injure or kill Rukmini's relatives, some of whom might block his way to the palace's inner sanctum, where the women were protected. The procession to or from the temple of Girija, Durga, would provide the perfect opportunity for Krishna to Kidnap Rukmini without harming her relatives. Yes, yeah, text 43. Yes, young Ripanga Jarajaswapanam Mahantro Banchan Puma Pati Rivadna Tamo Patatiai Pahatiai Yahyam Bujak Shonalam Heyamavat Prasadam Jayam Asun Rata Krishan Sata Jan Vidhisyat O lotus eyed one, great souls like Lord Shiva, hanker to bathe in the dust of your lotus feet and thereby destroy their ignorance. If I cannot obtain your mercy, I shall simply give up my vital force, which will have become weak from the severe penances I will perform. Then, after hundreds of lifetimes of endeavor, I may obtain your mercy. Text uh, uh. <coughs> The divine Rukmini's extraordinary dedication to Sri Krishna is possible only on a spiritual platform, not in the fragile world of mundane affection. So verse 44, we can chant this together. Brahmana, Brahmana, Uvacha, Uvacha, Ati, Ate, Kuhya, Kuhya, Sandeshaha, Sandeshaha, Yadudeva, Yadudeva, Maya, Maya, Ahritaha, Ahritaha, Vimrishya, Vimrishya, Kartam, Kartam, Yat, Yat, Cha, Atra, Atra, Kriyatam, Kriyatam, Tat, Tat, Anantaram, Anantaram, Brahmana Uvacha, Brahmana Uvacha, Vidyate Guhya Sandesha, Vidyate Guhya Sandesha, Yadu Deva Bhayahata, Yadu Deva Bhayahata, Vimrishya Kartam, <laughs> it's echo. It's a computer, I think. So. Uh, is it from in there? Or is it from yeah, reception? I think it's on someone's wrong. It's on someone's wrong. There's another class going on in there. <laughs> Simultaneous classes going on. <laughs> Vimrishya Kartam Yat Chatra Vimrishya Kartam Yat Chatra Kriyatam Tadanantaram Kriyatam Tadanantaram One second. 
Raksha. For the last, the last Raksha. line is it Anantaram or Anantaram? It's Anantaram. Mm -hmm. My mistake. Anantaram. Anantaram. There's Anantaram on the board. Anantaram. It's supposed to be Anantaram. It's the aim. Anantaram. Brahmana Uvach Brahmana Uvach Yete Guya Sandesha Yete Guya Sandesha Hadu Deva Mayahitaha Hadu Deva Mayahitaha Vimrisha Kartum Yachatra Vimrisha Kartum Yachatra Yatam Tadanantaram Yatam Tadanantaram
AC Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, to the 10th canto, 52nd chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled The Rukmini's Message to Lord Krishna. Om Gyanati Rabhihasya Gyanati Janashvara Tetrachuramilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Nama Shri Sham Nanana Vishati Putramatra Swarupam Rupam Tasyamaram Vrindavaram Krishna kidnapped Rukmini, Rukmini Haram. Famous means, at least traditionally among Hindus, it's well known. Now, it's not the usual topic of the followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Gauri Amashtanas who, when considering Krishna's pastimes, traditionally they will concentrate upon his Vrindavan pastimes. And in fact, Srila Vishwacharya mentioned that consideration of the Dwarka pastimes is that will block our uh, entrance into or appreciation for the uh, aspiring to the position of serving Radha and Krishna and Vrindavan. Now, this doesn't mean that Rukmini is, well, in one sense, yes. In one sense, less, these persons are less, but better to take it from the other perspective and say that Radha. Lila, that is more, because Rukmini, after all, is the eternal consort of Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And it's not that her love for Krishna is trifling. If we were to take all the love in this mundane world that's ever been experienced, throughout the course of time and put it all together it still wouldn't make up one moment of the love that Rukmini feels for Krishna. Which more glorifies the love of Radha. Now we're talking from our perspective theoretically. But it's not that Rukmini's love is condemned, rather that her love is so great but still we have to praise the love of Radha more then it just goes to show how great is that very confidential subject of Radha's love for Krishna. So really, love is what it's all about. The ultimate truth is love, but not the love of this world. And therefore to understand that or, or to begin to enter that First of all, we have to understand the philosophical truths. Tattva, you find that all the Acharyas, uh, they commenting on Bhagavatam, the Gorya Acharyas also, they 
they don't just well, the principal acharyas, they, they give uh, so many philosophical explanations also, which we find interspersed throughout this tenth canto. Otherwise, if we just hear the story that there was this princess who was very beautiful and all the kings, they uh, lusted after her and Shishupal was ready to marry her, but then she didn't want to marry Shishupal and she heard about Krishna and she sent a message and Krishna came and kidnapped her and fought off the opposing kings without understanding the context that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of God. It does sound like a, a love story. It is a love story, but a love story of this world. So, uh, first of all, we have to understand that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Uh, so even when we're discussing Leela as Srila Bhaktisthan Sarasura Thakur said, discussing his commentary on Chaitanya Bhagavad, he said, even though this book is full of the past times of Lord Chaitanya, but following my own uh, tendency, I have commented, I've given explanations in a very philosophical way. So Rukmini herself, uh, and that's a major difference between her and Radha, although they're not different also, is that Rukmini, she knows that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of God. And Radha does sometimes, not much. Or even if the residents of Vrindavan, they know that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, it doesn't really mean much to them. It doesn't make any difference to them appreciation of him, because their love for him is not based on knowing his glories. But for us, Krishna, he recommends that in Bhagavad Gita. Aham sarvasya prabhavo matas sarvam pramatate iti matva ajante bhambudha bhavasamantita. Knowing my glories as the uh, Supreme Lord, the generator of everything, that everything comes from me, those uh, devotees, they knowing this, iti matva, understanding this, they worship me with their intelligence and their feelings. Yeah. Can you sit the others? Mm. So Rukmini also, she knows that Krishna is what in the English language is called God. It's uh, a much misused and misunderstood word. Srila Prabhupada used the term Supreme Personality of God. And he defined that in all his books. What is the meaning of that? So, God, uh, G O D, generator, operator, destroyer. Srishti, Stiti, Kala. That word wasn't made based on that, but it can be analyzed like that. So Rukmini knew that Krishna is the supreme controller and he can do it. He can kidnap her. She uh, was actually putting her family members at great risk. Although she gave a, a, a means to uh, minimize that risk. That kidnap me when I come out of the temple. Don't storm the inner quarters. When I come out of the when I come out of the house, uh, then when I go for darshan of Girija, Durga, she was born from a hill, literally Girija. Then you kidnap me, so there's less risk. Of, but definitely, uh, killing is on the agenda. It's highly possible. Fighting is definitely going to be. Because the kings aren't just going to watch Krishna walk away. Srila Prabhupada explained in one lecture that you see the in the uh, Hindu version, sorry if you use the word Hindu, but it's the uh, culturally, it's the present manifestation of whatever's left of baby culture. So in the Hindu marriage ceremony, the bridegroom. He puts the 
red powder in the party and the wife is supposed to wear that from then on. So Srila Prabhupada explained that this originates from the Kshatriyas kidnapping and fighting and then taking the blood of the opponent and putting it on the newly won bride's head. <laughs> <laughs> Marriage by blood. So Rukmini, she knew that would happen and she was raised as a Kshatriyani Kumari, the daughter of a Kshatriya. So she knows the political art of how to uh, effect the kidnapping. She also knew how to drive a chariot. We, she drove the chariot when Krishna was busy fighting. So she was a uh, well-qualified wife for Krishna, who had taken the position of Yadu Deva. No more heart. On here, not known as Brajanath. The Rukmini would not want to hear that name, but the Lord of Vrindavan, the Lord of the Yadus. So she, Rukmini was coming out of the family. Of, that marriage means you leave one, the girl leaves one family and joins another family. So now she was going to join the families of the Yadu family, which would expand greatly uh, as Krishna was to marry more and more queens. Uh, Rukmini probably wasn't thinking of having 16,107 co-wives. Krishna was an eligible bachelor at that stage. Of course, in, for Kshatriyas especially, it's quite possible or quite normal to have more than one wife. Uh, even there was Again, Srila Prabhupada said that in, in Lucknow, which was the center of Muslim culture, Lucknow and Delhi, when now up there, he had several thousand wives. But Srila Prabhupada, he, made, he showed the difference also that one or two wives, they're happy and the rest are lamenting. They don't see their husband. They, don't, they can't be intimately mixed with him. But Krishna, he intimately mixed with every single wife. And everyone thought, I have captured Krishna because he's only with me. Yes. And that was true. They had all captured Krishna. But he wasn't only with all of them. So Krishna, he is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That was a very attractive feature for Rukmini. And naturally, every woman, unless they're raised in the modern age, they want a... Uh, husband who can protect them and who can protect better than Krishna. Rake Krishna Marege, Marege Krishna Rake. As Rukmini said later, many years later to Krishna, that anyone, any woman who accepts anyone else as a husband, they're more or less just cheated anyway. Because what is this? Bag of bones, pus, blood, liver, kidney, various organs within it. It's all within one bag decorated with some uh, hairs and mustaches. <laughs> and what's that? That's not a husband. Not the only, Krishna's the only real husband. <laughs> Similarly, around the other way also, if someone thinks this is my wife, then they're committing adultery. Because everyone is to be enjoyed by Krishna. Anyway, socially, conventionally, there are husbands and wives. But Rukmini understood that there's no possible better husband. Generally, Lord Shiva is worshipped as the ideal husband. He's, uh, he's the quiet, gentle type. But when he gets angry, he gets really angry. When he has to protect his wife. Of course, it's not every uh, woman who would want to live under a tree, but his devotees, they generally do well in this world, even though he's not interested in having a house. That also, Srila Prabhupada told us to When he got married, he had a beautiful house and everything, but all the wishes came and he had to give them all 
all the uh, dakshina. So he gave everything, including his house, and then he was left on the tree. So he likes that. He's he's a renunciant, not Shiva. Even though he has the material energy personified as his wife, and not just a Maya Devi, but the Maya Devi, Maya Devi number one. But he is not uh, influenced to enjoy that. So Krishna is the best husband possible within this material world. Lord Shiva is a very uh, powerful, faithful, uh, realized husband. And in spiritual existence, in real existence, Krishna, he is uh, quite an unpredictable character, uh, but that makes him all the more lovable. And he likes that also. He tried to elicit such emotions in Rukmini. She was quite predictable, it seems. But her love for Krishna was just completely uh, unfailing. And it's unfailing in the sense that it just flows toward Krishna. There's, no, there's nothing, there's no obstacle, there's nothing which will make her angry or uh, express any displeasure with Krishna. So Krishna is the supreme controller. This is the this is the point that we all have to understand. That Rupini, she understands completely and perfectly. Uh, she also knows him as her husband. Uh, it's a very intimate, personal relationship. But first, we have to understand Krishna is the supreme controller. That is the beginning of God realization to accept that there is a supreme control, which is not, shouldn't be such a difficult thing to understand. We understand that we are controlled. We don't want to die. We don't want to grow old. But we are forced by the laws of nature. Laws means there's a lawmaker. That lawmaker is God. Of course, the, in the modern, particularly at the present time, there's been a resurgence of atheism and arguing that these laws just, there are natural laws, but there is no lawmaker. But for all they may present it as being very scientific, it, it doesn't uh, resonate with common sense, basic common sense. I, uh, I often say that in public lectures when I'm presenting this point that I usually show my steel glass here. And I usually use this as a sample. Mm -hmm. That if we say this came into being by just some random interaction of chemicals, we say, no, that's not possible. <laughs> You say, well, the whole universe, which is far much more complex, how can you say that comes into, into being by random interaction of chemicals? So the opponents may say, well, you don't know science. And I say, well, you don't know common sense. <laughs> it's, you can say it just comes into being. You have all the fine-tuned constants by which the universe exists in a way which in which we on this planet experience that we are alive and other living beings are alive. But it appeals to the intelligence much more that there's a lawmaker behind it all. So that's the first point. Two points. Two points that I isolate. Srila Prabhupada preached on mostly throughout the world, establishing Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. We are not the body. We are eternal, spiritual, living beings. That's one point. And the, actually this point, there's this whole atheism versus theism argument going on. It's going on between theists, between Christians and Muslims on two, two sections of one side and atheists on the other. 
But the uh, understanding of reincarnation undermines both of them. Reincarnation, and then and that doesn't fit within your evolutionary theory, or, or that everything simply comes into being. Out of that. We don't believe in miracles, but everything is trying to go by science, except how the universe came into being. Everything else. Just from small things. But there was some there was nothing and then there was a nothing exploded. And here we all are today. Uh, well it's called a singularity, which is one way of saying that they don't know or they could call it a miracle. So uh, that there is a law maker, a governor, an operator, a destroyer, that it's a much better hypothesis. So that's what we are, we are not the body. So a lot of the atheistic arguments are against the uh, very inadequate theology of Christianity and Islam. And they say things like, well, if the Bible is supposed to have everything, why is there no mention of electricity or DNA or all these things? But actually, in the Vedic knowledge, what we, uh, we know that there is, there is highly advanced knowledge, you know, for instance, of astronomy, uh, anatomy, and so on. Exactly, DNA may or may not have been there. We don't know. A lot of the knowledge has been destroyed in the course of time. Literally destroyed, not just lost, but destroyed. So, anyway, uh, that we are eternal spiritual living beings. We are not matter. Life is not a product of matter. This point should be pushed. And I mean, there is so much, even we could say, uh, objectively observed evidence of reincarnation. It's the kind of thing the scientists don't like to look at. They prefer to ignore it. But there is uh, plenty of good evidence that even according to... Uh, mundane academic standards that reincarnation is a fact. So, uh, matter is not all in all. Actually, this is all in part of this. So, these two points. We're eternal living beings. We go from body to body to body. And there is a supreme controller. And we want happiness. We want to be happy. So, that happiness is linked with the supreme controller. He is Raso Saha. He is rasa, he is the mellows of bliss, love. Love is what it's all about. Ultimately, all the philosophy, all our searching, everything we aspire for, it comes to this point, as George Harrison writes in the introduction to Krishna. Everyone is looking for Krishna. Some people realize it and some don't. So Krishna is the supreme controller. This is the first point to understand. Love, yes, but first of all understand that he's the supreme controller because our conception of love <coughs> is mixed up in our present stage, in the conditional stage, our conception of love is mixed up with the misconception of ourselves being the enjoyers of this world. So our idea of love is mixed up with the idea of exploitation. And then we come to mundane sex, that enjoying exploiting. And that has expanded in exploiting the other and trying to control everything. Ishvaro Hamaham Bhogi. I am the controller. I am the enjoyer. So first of all, to understand that we're not the controller, we are controlled. And there is a specific supreme controller. So this point is to be understood. Love is ultimate. If we say this, many people will appreciate that. But uh, even people who don't have any idea of Krishna consciousness, but then we have to explain to them what that love means. That love is not uh, the love that you have for your wife or your children or your dog or your country or some kind of nebulous love for everything, but love is specifically for Krishna. He is the object, ultimate object of love for everyone, and that love means uh, Love means there's no consciousness of personal sense gratification at any level. It's simply uh, to 
act, think, speak, live for the transcendental pleasure of Krishna. So that's the meaning of love. That's, if we say love, people like it, but that their conception of love is intertwined with their rejection or ignorance of Krishna. Ignorance, ignorance of Krishna. So, first we should see, Krishna is the supreme control. Not a blade of grass moves without his sanction. Not at, from the cosmic level to the dance of the planets, the galaxies, and the stars, and down to the atomic and subatomic level, which is very similar in many ways. Uh, everything is controlled by Krishna. Krishna knows everything. He supervises everything. Still, he gives us some independence with which to work, some limited independence. That Krishna controls everything is not an excuse for us to neglect anything. But Krishna is the ultimate control. And therefore, man proposes, God disposes. We can try, but the result is ultimately with Krishna. So, our beginning understanding of God is that he is the controller, I am the control. Then we come to the platform, he is the master, I am the servant. There is a subtle difference in that. There's, there's, uh, it becomes more personal. Then we can gradually come to the point of uh, he is the predominating enjoyer. And uh, this is Bhaktisthan Sashwatakura's language. He is the predominating moiety. And Radha is the uh, predominated, the moities of the absolute truth. Moity means half. So, uh, they, their pastimes are pastimes of pure love in which satisfaction of Krishna's transcendental senses is the means of sharing love, but uh, of, of expressing love. And Krishna accepts love by accepting the uh, offerings of his devotees. But the beginning of our God consciousness to understand. He is the controller. We are controlled. Why does he control in such a way? That's a big problem for Christian theologians. Why does he control in such a way that there's so much suffering? You know, the problem of ego, the problem of suffering. But that is uh, all resolved by the, un by the uh, understanding that that Purusha Sukhaduka Nam Man makes his own destiny by his own actions. We, we are the cause ourselves of our suffering and, dis and apparent enjoyment in this world. Krishna is overseeing all of that, Upadrashtamamantacha. He's overseeing all of that, but we have, enough, we have a little independence to create our own suffering and enjoyment. So, uh, yeah, the beginning of God consciousness is to recognize that there is a controller, and if we get in line with his plan, then everything goes much better for us, instead of trying to resist it. Krishna has desires, what he wants us to do. And if we do that, if we do what he wants us to do, instead of pursuing our own agenda, then we actually serve our real self-interest. It seems that we can best serve our self-interest by being selfish. But that's not a fact, because constitutionally we are not independent beings. Constitutionally, we are controlled by Krishna. So our best self-interest is served by recognizing Krishna's superiority and agreeing to act as he desires. Just like uh, an animal. It's, it's the, the pet dog understands this principle. That my self-interest is served by serving the master's interest. If I do what he wants me to do and he tells me to sit, I sit. Uh, then the master will be affectionate to me and will serve me, actually. 
so we can find some lessons of God consciousness even in the dog, which is probably why people, at least in this part of the world, like dogs so much. Because it gives them a sense of being God. There's a living being who's dependent on them, who's affectionate to them, who they maintain. So, one takes the godly position in relationship to a dog. However, we would be better to ourselves take the position of a dog in relationship to Krishna. Our, our real self-interest would be served by doing that. Instead of making our own plans, we have so many plans. I will do this, I will do that. Karta, Amiti, Manita, anything. I am the doer. But we should know that Krishna he is in trouble. He has his plans. We can, we can have some semblance of being in control to some extent. We can be the controller of a dog. If we have some uh, extraordinarily good karma, we can be the controller of a whole country and become the prime minister of Britain, at least controller, at least political head. But that's the way the uh, samsara chakra, the wheel of fate works. Someone due to some good karma, they become the political head of the country, but simply by having that post, they incur so much sinful reaction that in their next life they have to become a dog or worse. So that's how it works. You get up to the top and then you must fall down without due to not having proper knowledge. So, uh, understanding Krishna's plan. How will we understand Krishna's plan? It's quite complex. We, we can understand that almost intuitively we can understand that there is a supreme controller, a supreme lawmaker. How that control works, it's not so easy to see. Because in many ways things seem to happen random. Why is it that we're just living our lives and then all of a sudden there's a, an accident and, or, or, or we win the lottery and then our life changes, either for worse or for better? Why is that? It's difficult to understand. And therefore we have to study and be taught how uh, everything works in this world according to our activities. We get results. That's why Gita says that that Dukeshva not Vidnamana Sukeshu Vigata Spriha Vita Ravana Mayakata Stita Diamunya that a person of steady intelligence is not disturbed when there's some cause for distress. <clears throat> and he's not elated when there's some cause for happiness. Why? Because he knows it's Anyway, these, these things come and go. I must have done something in a previous life to get this cause of distress. I must have done something in a previous life to get this cause of happiness. Cause of happiness means getting a position, getting money, being liked, being praised. But it's all the interactions of the modes of nature. It's nothing to do with me, actually. This is all some illusion. I, Either our life is like a horror story or it's like some kind of uh, daydream in which everything goes right and mostly it's something in between for most of us. Actually, if we understood what it was, we'd see it more like a horror story. But anyway, it's just not meaningful. It's, it's all temporary. Everything is changing all the time. We're, we're like characters in someone else's daydream. <laughs> the modes of nature they push us up, they push us down, we, we do some pious activity and then we get some good results. We, get, we do some sinful activity and we get some bad results. We, we go deeper beyond all this and see Krishna's hand in everything. And that we don't belong here. As long as we identify with all of this, then we keep on riding on the roller coaster of, 
of uh, of reactions to good and bad activity. So find Krishna, uh, the controller. What does he want to do? How to get in line with his plan? Then we can start to be extricated from this and come to our actual position. Uh, Krishna, he tells us that in if you surrender to me, Krishna says, take shelter, I will deliver you from all sinful reactions. And uh, implicit in this is that he'll deliver us from all pious reactions also. Uh, pious, that's also one kind of <coughs> impiety. All piety in this world which is conceived of without a relation to Krishna, it's all my ritertam yat pratiyetam nakutiyetam chatmani tad vidyad atmano mayam yatha bhasho yatha tama. Everything is all ignorance, it's all illusion. Everything, anything conceived of without a relation to Krishna, it's all illusion. So even the so called pious activities, it's all binding us in this material world. So, uh, Submit to Krishna. This is what Rukmini is doing, and that's her position. Savadhaman Parityata, Bhame Kamsharakshis. That whatever my parents and my family members have decided for me, she's rejected all of that and just surrendering to Krishna only. That's all, complete surrender. If you don't take me, then uh, anyway, I'm not going to go with this Shishupa. I'll just. I'm willing to wait for thousands of lives to get your mercy, but I'm only going to go with you. This is her complete surrender to Krishna. And Krishna reciprocated. She, she said, come and get me, come and save me. And Krishna, yes, all right, I must. Krishna, who is the supreme controller, he reciprocated with his devotee. Whatever plans Krishna had, what he was going to do, he just dropped it immediately. Just. Whatever else he had on his agenda, jump on a horse and gallop all the way. It's a long way. Even the fastest train doesn't move at that speed today. From uh, Dwarka to that's uh, Vidarbha, that, Kundina. That's how far would that be? As the crow flies, I don't know, maybe 800 kilometers or something. So Krishna immediately reciprocated. He's already agreeing. The Supreme Controller, uh, in reciprocation with Rukmini, who recognizes he's the Supreme Controller, is, is agreeing to be controlled by her immediately. Yes, she's calling. Yeah, all right, I'll go and capture her. And. Uh, in this way, we see how Krishna, who is the Supreme Controller, he becomes controlled by the love of his devotees. So we shouldn't think that this Rukmini Leela is something very small or insignificant. That's a very foolish way to think. Uh, certainly those who are cultivating love for Radha, Krishna and Vrindavan, they may not hear about these things so much. But for us. We, we should appreciate uh, how great is the love of Rukmini that Krishna, he is immediately ready to drop everything, run to her. She couldn't run to him, so he ran to her. She called him, you come. She was asking him to, you come and get me. Now you come and get me. I'm completely surrendered to you. I'm not if you don't come and get me, then I'll just have to wait. That's all. But I'm not going to go with anyone else. And then Krishna, he immediately came. Yeah, it's either now or I, he has to wait thousands of lifetimes. So we can think the same way. We have to go to Krishna either now or after thousands of lifetimes. Might as well go now. Why wait? Ultimately, we have to surrender to Krishna. There may be so many Shishupals and Jarasandhas who we might think it would be nice to associate with them, prestigious people of this world. But Rukmini, she wasn't interested. 
even from the social point of view at that time, Shishupal and Jurasandha were much better situated than Krishna. Krishna, as Shishupal later pointed out, was a, a dodgy kind of character. He was, uh, he started off as a cowherd boy, and then all of a sudden he just emerged in his youth. And we, and we, we heard first of all that he was the son of a Vaishya, and then all of a sudden he claimed to be the son of Vasudev, and Vasudev himself, not much of a Kshatriya. He's not, he didn't conquer anything, he was just locked up most of his life. <laughs> and uh, Krishna, he, he killed his maternal uncle, and now he's claiming to be the king of this Dwarka. So Shishupal's position was much more, his lineage was clear, his position as the king of Chedi is quite clear. So, Rukmini, uh, if she had just seen the material situation, then she should have chosen Shishupal. She had no interest at all in Shishupal. And Shishupal was wrong. Anyway, he hated Krishna. But his hatred for Krishna, can you imagine how much his hatred for Krishna increased after this? How, how humiliating. That he's a big Kshatriya king and he's getting married to this beautiful girl and all the other kings are coming. It's a big festival and Krishna just comes right in the middle of the <laughs> and takes out Rukmini and he's just smiling at the kings and waving like this. And they're, they're all just, <laughs> and Krishna nonchalantly, nonchalantly takes out Rukmini and shoots a few people up. <laughs> and Rukmini comes after and, and Krishna ties him up and gives him a punk hair and, and lets him go. To let a Kshatriya, to tie up a Kshatriya and let him go, that's the worst humiliating. If you kill him, it's much better. But to tie him up and let him, let him go means you don't care. Let him, let him go, let him get his armies, let him come back again. I don't care. I'm, I'm, just, I'm not bothered by him. It's extremely humiliating. That's Krishna. Well, Rukmini, she made the right choice, that's for sure. Uh, it's not imaginable. Shishupal Rukmini. It's just not imaginable. So we're very grateful to Krishna, the Supreme Controller, uh, Srila Prabhupada, as you all very well know, gave the uh, unusual name to Krishna here. Krishna has many names. Devotees, they may, as it were, make up names because there are unlimited qualities of Krishna, so devotees, they may make up something. Just like here, Yadu Deva. Of course, it's an eternal name of Krishna, but there are so many ways in, in which Krishna can be appreciated. It's not a, such a common name of Krishna. Uh, Yadotama, there are so many different names that can be said of Krishna in relationship to the Yadus. So Krishna gave the name Landanishwar. <laughs> Who ever heard of such a name? <laughs> Landanishwar. Pari Ishwar. So Krishna, he's the controller of London. At least from London, people used to think we're controlling the world. Maybe they're still thinking. Krishna, he's not the only controller of this little dot on the map called London. He's the controller of unlimited universe. But at least the people of London, they could come to understand that Krishna is the supreme controller here. Also, you're not exempt. <laughs> so, that's all your service to Krishna. To at least let the people of London know who the real boss is here. It's not the Prime Minister, it's not the Queen. You don't have anything against them. We respect them for their position. But, the Queen would do much better if she would do as all kings in India at least used to do. 
He will come down and bow down to Krishna. Then there will be proper monarch. Here we see the Bhishma, they had the family deity. Girija, so they had enough sense to. He's the king, but he will go and bow down before the deity. Recognize <clears throat> by the grace of Krishna, I've got such a position, by his grace. So we should bow down to him. Like Bharat, he was ruling the kingdom with the shoes of Ramachandra. Understand. He is the actually he is the boss. I am ruling, but on his behalf. That's the beginning. The uh, Tiruvananthapur in South India, some generations ago, the king he gave he put all the kingdom in the name of the deity, and he made himself the caretaker of that. So that's the uh, proper attitude of king. What to speak of? Anyway. So many tiny people, even such a great personality, if they can recognize Krishna as the supreme controller, so that you can make your ambition, that you can uh, preach Krishna Krishna so nicely that the queen will come and bow down before that other mm -hmm. nations. You should do. Actually, they should make Buckingham Palace. They make, we need a good temple in London. <laughs> <laughs> they make the, the big palace for the emperor of the only, but Krishna. Yeah. So, you know how he's being ambitious in Krishna's service? Anything's possible. He's the supreme control. Just a thought. So, Hare Krishna. Any yeah. questions, comments? Just a comment, Maya. Sorry. Um, today, just to remind everyone, it's the last Shila day. Prabhupada. Yeah, that's one thing. It's also the last day of the uh, World Holy Name Week. World Holy Name Week? Yeah, well, it's 10 days. So today is the last day. Of the 10th day? Yeah, and the, the, it's set on the principle, of, on the event of Prabhupada's arrival in Boston on this day. So t this evening, if anyone, well, first of all, if anyone is free to go on Harinam today, please do so as much as you can, or perform Harinam wherever you are. Um, and this evening at 6 o'clock, if the projector works properly, we'll be having a presentation on Srila Prabhupada's arrival in Boston. Oh. It's not real, I'm going to make it up today, but I mean, I've got bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. Something about like Prabhupada's arrival in Boston. So today is the event. Very Great significant. If any devotees want to come or was living outside the temple want to come, that'd be six o'clock this evening. Hare Krishna. There was an article in the Metro magazine the other day, newspaper, at least they said it was What's newspaper. Metro? It's a free magazine? It's a free it? newspaper they give out on a, in, in London. Yeah. I, didn't, I mean, someone brought it in, showed me last night. Yeah. It showed several of the per significant presidents of the world today, or prime ministers in this case, of the world today, in the newspaper, and it, it, it equated them with various species of dogs. They looked just like them. And it was quite funny, right there in the newspaper. And it, you it, saw the photo of a dog next to them? Yeah, yeah, a stick of dogs. And there was a specific dog in Kiev who looked just like the president of Russia. Um, although it was, you, Kiev is not in Russia. I won't mention names. But, um, and anyway, that's in our newspaper. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and our local prime minister also was was in there too, and yeah. so many different personalities. I and many years ago, uh, we had been doing traveling book distribution, and we drove in one evening about eight o'clock to Leicester in the van, and I just saw someone on one of these uh, what do you call that? They're like booths where you sell. Hot dogs and this kind of thing. What's that called? You know this trolley stall, stall or something. You're know, selling chicken. Some old guy selling chicken. His face looked just like a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> old man, and it looked quite obvious what his name is. Birthday. Already, the KFC that he looked. His face doesn't it? Yeah. 
It's just yeah. like a chair. It's a very common thing. You see people with their horse. Yeah, like horse. They look not chair, they look just like their horse. It's already happening. The, the, takes, the yeah. gross body starts to change. No, but that was their last. Yeah. Hmm? That was their last life. That was their last life. Yeah. Well, it looks like they're heading back.